Hi everyone and welcome back and welcome to another true crime and makeup video. Today we're going to be covering the case of Samantha Wolford and this case gained a lot of attention because Samantha wanted to become a YouTube star. She wanted to become famous, uh, which kind of did end up happening in the end, but she became famous obviously for all the wrong reasons. Hey YouTube, I just posted a video probably like 10 minutes ago. Hey guys, we're doing the mommy tag. Hey guys, I'm just kind of posting a vlog about what's been going on with me. And this case was quite strange to research because there is so much footage of Samantha online. I mean, her YouTube channel is still up. All of the videos that she ever uploaded are still there unless she took them down and privatized them before all of this happened. And I actually watched every single one of her videos that she still has up on her channel. She has a total of 88 videos on her channel and I watched every single one. At times I wanted to pull my hair out, I'm not gonna lie. And I just felt like I had to watch every single one of her videos and thankfully a lot of her videos are like the three, four minute mark. So they weren't like half an hour long each. And I know there've been other cases where people have YouTube channels or they've uploaded videos onto YouTube, but this one was different because Samantha's content, a lot of the time she would just sit down and talk to the camera about whatever's on her mind. And I've never had that before where I've been able to watch so much footage of someone and almost get a sense of who they are, at least the persona that they're putting across on camera anyway. And it was a bit weird, I'm not gonna lie. But don't cross me because that can be really, really mean. But Samantha's channel wasn't really getting a lot of attention, definitely not the kind of attention that she wanted, but it did in the end, uh, kind of. Not that she ever saw that, because obviously, uh, spoiler, she's in prison. But yeah, I suppose in a weird way, she got what she always wanted and that was to become famous. So, uh, yeah. So before we jump onto today's video, it's me on a different day, we do have a sponsor for today's video. So a huge thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. So a VPN, do any of you guys already use one? Well, I have been using a VPN ever since my first true crime video back in October. It was actually one of you guys that suggested that I should use a VPN for my true crime videos. And oh my God, that was a lifesaver. ExpressVPN lets you unlock content from anywhere in the world. And I cannot even tell you how useful that has been doing my true crime research, especially for the international cases, because without a VPN, there would be so much that I couldn't get access to. And you guys know I like to do the deep dive research. I like to get all the facts and ExpressVPN has truly helped me out in doing that. But that is not the only benefit. Ever since I started using ExpressVPN, I have been able to watch so many more TV shows that are from all different countries. It's just so easy to switch the country that you're in and it unlocks so many more TV shows on Netflix. Now I do have a recommendation for you guys. Have you heard me mention Line of Duty? I've actually mentioned it in a couple of videos now and I've seen some of you ask, what is Line of Duty? Like, what is that? Well, it is a British TV drama that is all about corruption in the British police force. It actually started like nine years ago, but I wasn't aware of it and I don't know why. Like, what was I doing in my life before Line of Duty? I actually only started to watch it at the beginning of this year and I've been all six series in like three weeks. Now I thought that it was just on the BBC in the UK. However, guess what? It's actually on the Canadian Netflix. So if you don't live in the UK, you can use ExpressVPN to switch to the Canadian Netflix and then you have all seasons of Line of Duty to watch. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Just wait until you get to season three. And then if you watch Line of Duty, you'll know exactly what I mean when I say you need to get AC12 onto the case. I and you guys can get three months of ExpressVPN for free when you go to expressvpn.com forward slash Danielle. I will also put a link in my description box. Thank you again to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video. And thank you to every single one of you watching because without any of you, I would not have these opportunities. And now let's jump into today's case. So Samantha was born on the 28th of August, 1989, making her a Virgo. And Samantha was the eldest of three siblings and her mother was called Rosie Walford. Now I couldn't find out the exact birthplace of Samantha and where she grew up, but I know she lived near and in her later life, she did live in Mount Pleasant, Texas. Her family describe her as very bubbly, very friendly. A lot of people like her. And I can definitely agree with that from her YouTube video. She's definitely quite outgoing in her personality. She's very talkative. And I know you can't always judge 
what people are truly like on camera, but she did come across kind of like an extrovert. She seemed very confident. We were up all night, of course, so I'm dead tired. I've been on my feet all day long in a pair of high heels. I don't wear high heels, ever. This chick is not a high heel person. But obviously through the camera, you never truly know what is going on in someone's head. But her family also describe her as very nurturing and very motherly. And from a very young age, Samantha knew what she wanted to do in life. And that was be a mother. She wanted a family. And then at the age of 19, her dream came true because she fell pregnant with her high school boyfriend. And not only was that a shock, but she actually found out that she was having twins. And the father of her children did stick around, but he was only really around for a couple of years. And Samantha kind of figured out that, um, yeah, he's not the one, he's not the best father, he's not husband material, and she did end up leaving him. And Samantha became a single mom and she had to figure out how to make this work. How was she gonna support her children. And Samantha said in one of her YouTube videos that she did work three jobs at one time whilst also putting herself through college and bringing up the twins. When I was 18, I was working three jobs to try and support myself. Their dad wasn't helping out. I didn't have any, you know, three jobs at 18 and still trying to go to college. And I don't know what her jobs were apart from one, and she was a newborn photographer, but she did have other side jobs as well. It was around this time where Samantha met a new man, Ernie Ibarra on Facebook, and they instantly hit it off. Ernie was born on Christmas Day, 1985, in Mount Pleasant, Texas. And Ernie has been described as an extremely caring person. He would literally do anything for anyone. He was always like there for people, reliable. And Ernie was extremely intelligent. He was just one of those kids in school. It was just super smart. He was a bookworm and he would stay up all night reading books. But he was also really into computers, technology. It was just something that he took to like a duck to water and he was also super into gaming. But computers ultimately became like his main like hobby, passion in life and it was said that he could literally take a computer apart and put it all back together. And that just blows my mind. Like, I don't know how people do that. And Ernie did go on to study technology at college and he went on to get a job at a local baseball bat manufacturer. And it was said that this job was pretty highly skilled. Not just anyone could walk in and do that job. You did have to have like the special skills, the special knowledge, you know? And Ernie was doing really well for himself. His family was so proud of him because of how well he was doing. So Samantha and Ernie's relationship gets off to a very good start. They just instantly click. They have a lot of the same interests. They're both really interested in like tattoos, piercings, and they would often go together to get tattoos done. And Samantha would sometimes talk about her and Ernie's relationship online on her YouTube channel. Both the good and the bad, uh, Samantha definitely overshared. He was basically family, but we had never face to face met, which scared the hell out of me because I don't meet people online. I see all these stories about women meeting people online and them getting killed. Yeah. Samantha's phone was her life. She was always on social media. She was always thinking about her YouTube channel. She was always thinking about videos that she wanted to film. And this was definitely one aspect of Samantha's life that Ernie did not like. Ernie was quite a private person. He didn't want his private life just be put on social media, on YouTube. And Samantha was the complete opposite. Samantha, it seemed like anywhere, she wasn't really scared of sharing pretty much anything online. And of course, no relationship is perfect, but in Samantha and Ernie's relationship, I think the YouTube channel and the fact that she would share so much on social media was definitely the element of their relationship that they would clash over the most. Now, it wasn't too long after they started dating that Ernie actually spent a little bit of time in prison. And he spent, from what I could find out, roughly around a year in prison. And it was reported that he got into a little bit of it said fight, but I don't know, an altercation with a police officer. So Ernie was pulled over by this police officer and he had quite a few traffic violations. And it said that Ernie's temper just got the better of him and he was charged with assaulting a police officer. Once Ernie left prison, he wanted to make a fresh start. It said that prison did mature him and he was at that point in life where he just wanted to take things a little bit more seriously, grow up, and he felt like he wanted to take his 
and Samantha's relationship to the next level. So he asked Samantha to move in with him. He wanted to live with her and her two children. And he wanted to give being a family like a proper go. And this is what they did. They all moved in together and it said that they're Family was just like really close and they had like a really loving, affectionate little family. Samantha said in one of her YouTube videos that Ernie wanted to adopt her two children. But he still is my best friend and he wants to adopt my kids. He wants to, um, he doesn't like the fact that their father's not on the birth certificate. So the, the, the void on the birth certificate really bugs him and he wants me to um, allow him to put his name there and I mean, he really is. He's just the greatest person ever. I love him to death. And I do just think this shows the kind of person that Ernie was. I mean, we know that he's very loving, very caring, but I do think it says a lot that he wanted to step up and be a parent to Samantha's children. But not only that, Samantha and Ernie wanted to extend the family even more. They wanted to have more children together. And it wasn't long after deciding this that Samantha did fall pregnant again. And guess what? It was twins again. It's like, what are the chances of that? I mean, I don't know, maybe it's more common than I think, but that just seems crazy to me that someone would have twins and then have another set of twins, like the next pregnancy. But anyway, their family of four, the twins and Ernie and Samantha, was now growing to a family of six. And money was already tight for the family when they were a family of four. And now adding two more, was just gonna make the financials a little bit tighter than they were. And I don't know the exact ages of Samantha and Ernie at this particular point in the story. Obviously I know when Samantha and Ernie were born, but I don't know when the twins were born. But Samantha is in her early 20s and Ernie is in his mid 20s. Samantha was the one that stayed home looking after the four children, which meant that the whole family relied on Ernie to earn the money and to financially provide for the family, which meant that Ernie ended up getting a second job job at a local pizza place. And he didn't mind getting a second job. All he wanted to do, like his main focus, was to support his family, was to provide for his family. But working two jobs is not easy. He was working ridiculously long hours. And after a period of time, that would take a toll on anybody. And Ernie was always exhausted. And because the children had grown up a little bit at this point, I don't know the exact ages, and he thought that maybe it would be a good time for Samantha to also get a job to help to ease the pressure a little bit on Ernie so he wasn't the only person that was providing financially for the family. Now, like I said, I did watch all of Samantha's videos and she did talk about jobs that she had, but I'm gonna be honest here, it wasn't always clear watching Samantha's videos whether she was talking about the present or the past. She talked about that she had a job at her dad's tattoo shop. She worked on the piercing section of the shop and she did the piercings and she ran the piercing section of the shop. And I am inclined to think that that was a past job because if that was her current job, Ernie wouldn't be telling her to get a job. So it was a bit difficult at times to figure out what the truth was from Samantha's videos, like what was actually current and what was past and what was even real. But anyway, back to the story, what is reported is that she didn't have a job. So that's what we're just gonna go with. Samantha wasn't too keen on getting a job. She actually liked spending all of her time at home and she quite liked not having to work. So Samantha had an idea she wanted to start making money from her YouTube channel. And this job would be absolutely perfect for Samantha because one, she could stay at home pretty much all day. She also loved social media. She loved talking. She loved talking about herself specifically. And she felt like this would be the perfect job for her. And also on top of the fact that she did want to be famous. And Ernie accepts this. He's actually quite supportive of what Samantha wants to do. And he continues to work his multiple jobs and Samantha tries to grow her YouTube channel. Now, I'm not exactly sure what Samantha's strategy was with her YouTube channel because there was none, basically. There was no strategy whatsoever. The best way I can describe Samantha's channel is random. It kind of seemed like Samantha would just turn on the camera and say whatever is on her mind at that time. There are lots of different kinds of videos on her channel, but the most common would be that she would find like an article or something online about something going on in the world or even about a conspiracy theory or about somebody that was famous or whatever. And she would essentially read out the article on video and give her reaction to it. So kind of like a reaction video, 
but more to like nude articles and stuff like that. And a lot of the articles that she would pick would kind of revolve around child abuse. Not all of them, but there was a lot of child abuse, a lot on the CPS. But there was other kinds of content on her channel. There was a couple of makeup tutorials. There was a couple of hauls. There was some vlog style footage where she would actually be out somewhere. There was tattoo videos, piercing videos. But most of the style of content that she did, she would just be sat there talking to a camera, whether it was about an article or something that she found online or just about herself or her family or her children. And this was back in 2012 and YouTube was a very different place in 2012 than it is now. There wasn't so much pressure to like have really good cameras or have really good lighting or have like really good backgrounds. Not that I have a good background, but you know what I mean? There wasn't as much pressure. It was more amateur and it wasn't as crowded. There wasn't as many creators online. So it was easier in some senses to stand out. And I do think that Samantha could have had a chance to make something of her channel if she had a little bit more strategy, a little bit more focus, a little bit more direction and planning in her videos. But yeah, her videos are just random. And this goes on for quite a while with Samantha trying to grow her YouTube channel and Ernie working multiple jobs to earn money for the family. And in the beginning, like I said, Ernie was pretty supportive of Samantha's choices. However, after a while, he did get really fed up. And it wasn't just the fact that Samantha wouldn't go out and get a job and she was just trying to grow her YouTube channel, which wasn't really going anywhere. It was the fact that when Ernie got home, Samantha was also neglecting her chores, the house, the house was always a mess. It was always dirty. And Ernie would have to pick up the slack in the house as well. Like he was pretty much doing everything. And it seems like Samantha's only focus, only priority was YouTube. Everything that Samantha did, it was always about like, oh, could I film this? Like, what could I film? Like, what could I put on my YouTube channel? And this seemed to come above paying attention to her family, to looking after the house, and it even came above looking after her children. Even the things that she did with the children, it was all about how it could possibly turn into a YouTube video. And there's definitely evidence of this on her channel. She does show her children quite a lot on her channel, and it does kind of seem like sometimes, this is just my observation, but it does kind of seem like she does use her children for views and this started to bother Ernie which I can't say I blame him he didn't like their personal lives just being put on YouTube and he especially didn't like the children being put on YouTube and even after Ernie's request to stop putting the children on YouTube uh, Samantha thought it was a really good idea to film her daughter dancing in the car whilst Samantha was driving. And it's like, you're driving with a child. Maybe you should be concentrating on driving, looking at the road, not filming your daughter. And Ernie quite understandably didn't like this. He went a bit crazy over this because Samantha is being reckless and she's just filming her daughter dancing because she thought it would make a cute YouTube video. And Samantha was quick at times to air some family drama. Like I said, she was a bit of an oversharer and it is reported that Ernie had just had enough of Samantha's behavior and he left her. And it was not long after this that Samantha actually suffered an injury when a baby changing station fell on her at Walmart. Walmart. And she did actually get quite badly injured from this. She did talk about this on her YouTube channel. And like I said, Samantha isn't the most clear in her YouTube videos, but from what I could make out, she injured her neck and her hips. And she was in quite a lot of pain. She wasn't sleeping very well because she was in so much pain when she was lying down. And she also struggled to even pick up her children. Because of her injuries, she was struggling in the house. She was struggling with her children. And Ernie's sister, Abby, actually started to help out. And I think it is around this time that Samantha does start to struggle a little bit with her mental health. I mean, she has been injured in this incident at Walmart, but she's also struggling with the fact that her YouTube channel isn't doing as well as she'd hoped. I couldn't find out exactly how many subscribers she had, but it was definitely under 100 and she was struggling to even get 100 views a video. And Ernie could tell that Samantha was struggling. So he agreed to like give it another shot, help her out, move back in, mainly for the sake of the children, but like he decided to give it another shot. So they're giving their relationship another go and then unexpectedly, Unexpectedly, Samantha falls pregnant again. And she even talks on her YouTube channel that neither herself or Irony really want this baby. Like it's not really good timing. That's a little, yeah. No, I'm not exactly excited about this. And she's also convinced as well that it will be twins because so far she's had two sets of twins and she's convinced that this next pregnancy will also be twins. And Ernie as well, he's thinking about the finance. He's thinking 
things are already tight. I already have two jobs and we're already just about coping. But on Samantha's YouTube channel, she moans about Ernie and she says that he's not really around during her pregnancy and he doesn't really want anything to do with her. And I don't know how true it is. I don't want to accuse her of lying or anything, but that is the only place that I heard that Ernie didn't want anything to do with the pregnancy. I didn't see that anywhere else. And obviously I know it's coming from Samantha who is there in the situation, but some Sometimes it does feel like she's exaggerating or dramatizing things just to make maybe a more interesting YouTube video. There's also a little argument between Samantha and Ernie and it's a really stupid argument. and I didn't really know where to fit it in, but I thought it was important to say it in the story. So Ernie likes to play games. The game that Ernie is playing, his online avatar marries another female gamer's avatar. He didn't know this female gamer, like it was just someone that he played the game with. And Samantha did not like this at all. And that is the extent I know of that little argument. And on the surface, it seems kind of like a stupid thing to argue about because that argument did blow up into quite a big thing. But we don't really know what else could have gone on. Maybe Ernie was flirting with that other girl. Maybe that could explain why Samantha went so crazy and did blow up. But things between the pair did seem to get a little bit better when their child did arrive because Samantha did only have one child. She didn't have another set of twins. Samantha and Ernie actually decide, you know what, we should get married. And they ended up getting married in just a small ceremony. And friends and family just noticed that even though the relationship was maybe a little bit better than it was before, it was still strained. There was still arguments arguing all the time. It wasn't the best situation. They weren't always the happiest. And then one day, Abby, who is Ernie's sister, was visiting Samantha and Samantha made a shocking confession. She said to Abby that her and Ernie had gone into an argument the night before and Ernie had actually hit her. And Samantha ends up showing Abby the bruises on her arm to prove it. And Abby and the whole of Ernie's family were just completely shocked about this because it was just so out of character for Ernie. He was such a caring person. He would never lay his hands on anyone. And Ernie's family did not believe this at all. It wasn't just this one time that Samantha had come out and said that Ernie was abusing her. From this moment, she was going around and telling multiple family members that Ernie was abusing her. And these abuse claims were never proven. However, Samantha did end up reporting Ernie one time for domestic abuse and Ernie was arrested. However, he was released and nothing actually came of this. However, Samantha stands by these claims and she continues on to tell multiple people that Ernie is abusing her. And she also says repeatedly that she wants something done about it. Now there is only one video on her channel where Samantha does bring up abuse and she doesn't actually say it herself. It was like this video where she had all of these like post-it notes and there's all these messages on these notes and she just keeps revealing one after the other. And it's on one of those notes where she says that she has been abused. And their relationship just kind of went on like this for a very long time, very tense, very strained, with Samantha just telling loads of different people that Ernie was abusing her. And then on the night of the 19th of February, 2015, Samantha is currently 25 at this point, something absolutely terrible happened. Samantha calls up her mom in the middle of the night and she is just screaming frantically. She tells her mom that there has been a break-in in the home. So she told her mom that three men broke into the house just in the middle of the night while Ernie, the children, Samantha were all sleeping. Samantha then said she was ripped from her bed, thrown onto the floor face down while the three men started to violently beat up Ernie. The three men then tied Samantha up and then they kidnapped Ernie. So as you can imagine, Samantha Samantha's mom is panicking. She's freaking out at that point. Can you imagine your child phoning you up in the middle of the night and telling you that? So her mom phones her sister, who's called Ginger, so Samantha's aunt. And the aunt lives closer to Samantha and that's why she phoned her sister to go over because she would get there before she could. So Ginger, of course, agrees and she's first to arrive on the scene. And when she went into the house, she went straight upstairs and Samantha is still tied up on the floor. Samantha's hands were bound and also her feet. And then Ginger, after she found Samantha, her next thought immediately went to the children because there is five children in this house. And thankfully the children were completely unharmed. They were actually still asleep, which Ginger kind of thought, um, that's a little bit weird. If there's been this break-in, if there's been this violent attack, 
They were violently beating up Annie. How is it that not one child woke up? But another thing that Ginger also found weird is that all of the children were asleep in the same room, which apparently was not normal. They didn't all share the same room. So the fact that they were all still asleep, but also asleep in the same room was just very suspicious. And this is definitely something to remember because we do come back to this point later on in the video. So Ginger unties Samantha, obviously. And the first thing she wants to know is how the hell did you phone your mom if you're tied up? And Samantha said that she did it with her nose. That's right, you heard that. Samantha said she phoned her mom using her nose. She somehow, with her hands tied behind her back, wiggled to the phone and then used her nose to dial the number or to phone her mom. So when I heard this whole nose thing, I was like, can you actually do that? Like, can you actually use your nose? <laughs> so um, I tried it. Now I could do it. I dialed a couple of wrong people. <laughs> Cause it's very weird. You can't like judge where your nose is gonna go. Um, so it's not the easiest, but it is possible. But it was easier for me to do because I have Face ID on my phone. Now this is back in 2015 and Face ID didn't exist. So let's just say she had an iPhone and it had fingerprint ID, which obviously she couldn't do with her nose. But when you do have the fingerprint ID, like if you try a few times and it doesn't work, it does kind of come up for you to put the passcode in. Like I said, it's kind of hard to judge accurately where your nose is gonna go. <laughs> So it's highly likely that you would get your passcode wrong. And obviously if you get it wrong so many times, you get locked out of your phone. Or maybe she didn't even have a passcode on her phone, which would have obviously made everything a lot easier. And I feel like I've been going on about this nose dialing for a very long time now, but you guys should try it. Like see if you can do it. So yeah, it's definitely possible. This story is plausible but it's suspicious and uh, I'll just leave it there. Ginger also notices that Samantha's car is missing and she's like, where's your car? Like, where is it? Did they steal it? Where is it? And Samantha just shrugged off this question and said, oh, it's not supposed to be here right now. Okay, that's a good enough explanation. I mean, I feel like you should maybe explain yourself a little bit more than that if your husband's just been kidnapped. The police arrive on the scene not long after Ginger arrives and Samantha shows them around the crime scene. There's actually footage from a body cam of Samantha showing the police around the crime scene. What they have you tied up with? Come, come show me where it was. Uh, don't, don't touch it. Just... That was around my ankles. What was that originally? They got that out of my top drawer. It was, was a dress. A dress and the ribbon. The ribbon they had with them. Okay, they brought that pink ribbon with them. Or did it come from out of there? They may have got it out of there before they woke us up. They were using this to tie him up with. I don't know what this is, but they were using that to tie him up with. Okay. And immediately the police are looking around and they're like, something's not quite right here. I mean, obviously the police go to a lot of crime scenes, but they kind of know generally what crime scenes look like for different crimes. And this didn't look like a break-in and a kidnap. They could see from the scene that there had been some kind of struggle, but it just was weird. There was something off. Nothing had been stolen from the house. It just seemed weird that these three men apparently broke in in the middle of the night, kidnapped Ernie and didn't steal anything. They didn't take anything. They left all of these valuables just lying around. The only really noticeable damage to the house was that the door had been kicked in and the police were just getting a feeling that the crime scene almost looked a little bit staged. So the police take Samantha in for questioning and she starts by telling them that she was asleep when the three men broke in and the first time she became aware of them was the sheets were like pulled back from her. And before she knew it, she was being thrown onto the floor. Then she saw the three men that broke in and they started to violently beat up Ernie. And slowly got on floor face down and pressed the blade that he had against my throat. And while he's top of tying my hands, there's a bunch of fighting going on. And they kept hitting him, they kept hitting him. This police ask her, like, what did these three men look like? Can you give us any details? 
But literally all she could say was that they were dressed in all black and they were wearing masks so she couldn't see their faces. She then tells the police that the three men tied her up and then kidnapped Ernie. And it was at this point that she somehow managed to call her mom with her nose. And while Samantha is being interviewed, obviously the police are out looking for Ernie. And the first thing that police are trying to do is track down Ernie's cell phone because Samantha told the police that the intruders took Ernie's cell phone. So the police are like, okay, so if we can track down this cell phone, at least we'll know where the intruders are, which will hopefully lead to Ernie. And there is good news because the police actually get a ping on Ernie's cell phone and they do tell Samantha this. And because of this, they're able to like know at least one of the locations that Ernie, at least Ernie's cell phone has been. And they're like, this is really good. Like this is gonna hopefully help us track down your husband. Keep note of this. And while the search for Annie is going on, the police continue to question Samantha. And there is just something about Samantha, just like her behavior, like the things that she was saying was just making the police question like, is this really true? Like, can we trust what she's saying here? One thing that the police found extremely weird is how many times Samantha kept telling them how perfect her and Ernie's relationship was. It's almost like she was trying to convince the police how perfect her and Ernie's relationship was so the police wouldn't suspect her in any way of anything. And of course the police actually know that the relationship is not as perfect as she's making out because remember there was that incident where she reported the domestic abuse. So even though this allegation wasn't proven to be true or false, it's still on their records and it still shows that maybe their relationship is not as perfect. And the police continue to interview Samantha through the night. The intruders broke in and took Ernie around 1 a.m. and it was very quickly that the police came and actually took Samantha in for questioning. So they've been questioning Samantha for a very long time. And over and over again, Samantha just keeps repeating herself saying like I don't know what's going on here I don't know who would do this I have no clue about anything and then around 9 a.m the next day Samantha actually changes her story she actually turns around to the police and says I think I might know who did this but before she reveals anything before she gives up any names she wants assurances that she's not going to get in trouble and also that is why she has kept this information to herself because she thought because she knew who did it, she would get in trouble. So Samantha starts with her story about how she knows maybe who did this. <laughs> okay. I've been up in the hospital with my bitch Charlotte. It's talking about how a man shouldn't treat a woman that way and how you don't do those things to a person. Okay. And he's gonna deal with the situation. She starts by saying that she met a man in a hospital just a few days before when she was visiting her friend Sharla. And this man was Jonathan Sanford, who was 25 years old. He was actually the boyfriend of the friend she was visiting. And he had also recently been released from prison. Now, Samantha's friend was in hospital for a cesarean section so she was in hospital for at least a few days so Samantha went to the hospital a few times and he was there at the hospital and on one occasion when Samantha was visiting Charlotte in hospital she started talking to her about Ernie about how he would constantly pester her how he was always checking up on her and also about the abuse we know that Samantha does like going around telling everybody this. And it was at this point that Jonathan joined the conversation and he said to Samantha that himself and his brother-in-law, Jose Ponce, could quote, take Ernie out of the picture, end quote. Now this is Samantha's story and apparently she didn't know what Jonathan meant when he said, take Ernie out of the picture picture. I don't think it takes a genius to figure it out. However, being interviewed and everything and everything that's gone on, she's starting to wonder whether Jonathan could be behind this. She also said that apart from seeing Jonathan, those few occasions that she visited her friend in hospital, she had no prior relationship with him. She didn't know him 
really. So the police go and arrest this Jonathan person and bring him in for questioning. And he pretty much straight away admits that it was himself and two other men that broke into the house and that they kidnapped Ernie. He also named his two accomplices, which one of the accomplices was his brother-in-law, Jose Ponce, and that the other accomplice was an acquaintance, Octavius Rhymes. And Jonathan, surprisingly, confirms pretty much all of Samantha's story, that it was them, that the first time they met was at the hospital. However, he adds a little detail that maybe Samantha left out. Maybe she didn't mean to leave this out. I don't know. But Jonathan reveals to the police that uh, Samantha was involved in the whole plan. She knew about the whole goddamn thing. Jonathan revealed that the initial plan was to get Ernie on a drugs charge. So he would get arrested, sent to prison, and that was how they were gonna quote, get him out of the picture. So they started to make preparations for this plan of planting drugs in Ernie's car. They travel and they go and pick up some meth from one of Jonathan's cousins. And when they return, they're all kind of like meeting up and planning this at Octavius's house. So they're planning everything. They have the drugs. They're trying to figure out like how best to go about this. But as the evening and as the little meeting that they're having carries on, the plan starts to get uh, darker. Both Jonathan and Jose ask Samantha how she would feel about Ernie dying. And in response to this, Samantha was just like, are you serious? And it wasn't like a, are you serious? Like an angry, like, oh my God, you're out of your mind. Are you serious? It was kind of like a, are you serious? that kind of, that kind of way. And they respond to her like, yeah, we're serious. Like we can make this happen. They told her to think about it. And it's like, if you want this to go ahead, all you need to do is leave your front door unlocked. Because I assume that if she locked her front door, for example, they were just gonna go ahead with the drugs plan and plant the drugs in his car. But if she left the front door unlocked, they would go in, kidnap Ernie and kill him. So all of them think that this is a pretty good plan. However, Jonathan realizes that one thing could actually disrupt the plan and make everything go wrong. And that is the five children that will be in the house. I mean, obviously one of them is a baby infant. They're not really going to do much, but the others are young children at this point. They could wake up they could walk into their parents' bedroom at any moment and see what is going on. But Samantha replies and says, oh, don't worry about this. I know what I can give them to make them fall asleep fast and like really fall asleep so they don't wake up. Remember, I told you to remember about the kids. Well, I don't know what she gave them. I don't know, she hasn't said. It's not in any of the reports or anything. And I just wanna point out here that during this little meeting about essentially killing Ernie, Samantha has all of her children with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all children are in this house whilst their mother and all of these people are planning their father's murder. I just think this is so ironic because literally in Samantha's first YouTube video, at least the first one that's on her channel right now, she is so judgmental about other parents, about how other parents treat their children and how the CPS should get involved. Does it sound like CPS is doing their job in any way? Child Protective Services. I just feel like maybe the CPS should have looked into her. And she also makes comments and judges parents quite a lot in quite a few videos. And I just think you're no better. <laughs> you are no better. And at this point in the meeting, it is getting late. It is getting closer to midnight. And Octavius and Jonathan drive Samantha and the children home. And they drive them back in Samantha's car. And when they get to Samantha's house, they remind her of the plan. They remind her all you need to do leave the front door unlocked. Jonathan and Octavius then leave in Samantha's car, which obviously explains why Samantha's car is not at the home because they plan to use this car for the kidnapping. And then Octavius and Jonathan then drive to Walmart and they pick up all of the essentials for carrying out their plan. They then go pick up Jose, don't know why he wasn't there originally in the car, but whatever, they go pick up Jose and then the three of them 
start smoking the meth that they had originally planned to plant in Ernie's car. And that's gonna really encourage rational thinking, isn't it? They then head back to Samantha's house and when they get there, they test the door. And unfortunately, Samantha left the door unlocked. So they entered the house, they went to Ernie and Samantha's room. They grabbed Ernie from the bed and they start violently beating him up. They left Samantha in the bed. She was actually awake and watching all of this happening. They take Ernie, they put him in Samantha's car. They also take Ernie's cell phone. And then once Ernie is in the car, they return back to the house and they tell Samantha, let's tie you up. Let's make this more believable. Your story will be more believable if you are found tied up. But before they tie her up, Samantha makes that phone call to her mom. Remember that phone call where she's screaming frantically? telling her mom about the break-in, about the kidnap and everything. Yeah, she does that before being tied up whilst the three men are just like kind of hanging around in her room. So after telling the fake story to her mom, she then willingly gets tied up. And then Jose, Jonathan and Octavius leave the house with Ernie in Samantha's car. They take Ernie to some woods in nearby Camp County in Texas. And this is tragically where Ernie Ibarra lost his life when Jose Ponce shot him in the back of the head. So this is the story that Jonathan told the police. And after he revealed the details of the murder, the police ask him, like, can you take us to the murder? Can you take us to where it happened so we can find Ernie's body? And this is exactly what they did. Jonathan took them directly to Ernie's body. The police also arrest Jose Ponce and Octavius Rhymes and charged all three of them, including Jonathan, for the murder of Ernie. And now the only thing they have to deal with, the only person they have to deal with, is Samantha. So while the police have been away from the interrogation room, they've just kind of left Samantha in the room. She's definitely acting a little strange in that room. She was definitely doing one of her favorite things, and that was playing up to the camera. It was like a little whiteboard in the room, and she starts writing on the whiteboard, have you found my husband yet? which now that we know what we know and that she was involved in all of this, it's just, Oh God, it's just, it takes a special someone, doesn't it, to do what Samantha has done. And when the police return from finding Ernie's body, they go into Samantha and they just lay it all out on the table. They're like, we know exactly what happened. We know you're involved. I think you're lying your butt up what I think. I think you've been lying to me this whole thing. You did get around. I think you're a liar what I think. I think you know exactly who did this and I don't buy your story for a minute. That's what I think. I have not done anything. Well, but I didn't have it done. That? And I did not do anything. Hey. But Samantha continues on pleading her innocence. But the police aren't buying her story anymore. They're just not. And they do charge Samantha with the murder of Ernie as well, which she pleads not guilty to. And at the trial, the main job of the prosecutor is to prove Samantha's involvement and prove that she was indeed involved in the planning of the murder. Samantha continued to plead that she was innocent and that she didn't really even know Jonathan, apart from the brief meeting that she had at the hospital. But at her trial, Jonathan actually came out and said that this wasn't true. Jonathan even came out at trial and said that he had been helping look after her children. And the day before the murder happened, he had taken Samantha and Ernie's children to Walmart. And there is CCTV footage to prove this. And a witness actually came forward to testify that Samantha was involved in the murder and that was Jose's girlfriend who was actually at the house when the planning of the murder of everything was going down and she overheard Samantha actively participating in the planning in the conversations of everything and other witnesses came forward at trial as well and they had said that on other occasions so not the one where she was planning the murder on other occasions they had heard Samantha say that she wanted Ernie quote taken care of because he was abusing her. And at one point as well, she'd even tried to arrange a hitman to take Ernie out. And then the final, probably the most damning piece of evidence was when Samantha was in the interrogation room, she still had her mobile phone on her. And remember when I said that the police had gone into Samantha and told her, 
We've gotten a ping on Ernie's cell phone. We think we know where he is. At least we know kind of the location where he was in. Well, because Samantha still had her cell phone, it was found that Samantha had left the room to phone her mom when in actuality, she started texting Octavius. The first message that Samantha sent to Octavius said, kill Ernie's phone, shut that shit down. And then the second message that she sent to Octavius said, quote, ditch phone, move. She then thought she was so clever because she deleted those messages off of her phone and she clearly thought that that would mean that the police would never see them. And after all of this evidence, the jury did find Samantha Wolford guilty of aggravated kidnapping and murder. And she received a 99 year sentence for the murder and a 50 year sentence of the aggravated kidnap. And these sentences are to be served consecutively. So yeah, that means she's probably never going to get out. Both Jonathan and Jose pled guilty. So they didn't go to trial, but they both received 50 years for the murder and the kidnap of Ernie. Octavius Rhymes pled not guilty. And then at trial, he was found guilty and he received a 93 year sentence. But the one thing left to clear up is what was her motive? And I've seen various theories discussed online. I mean, obviously she does claim abuse. She does claim that Ernie was abusing her. And like I said, this hasn't been proven. There is absolutely zero evidence. But one theory that I saw was that Samantha was actually worried that Ernie was gonna leave her and try and get custody of the children. And yeah, Samantha murdered him to prevent this. However, another theory and I feel like I'm kind of leaning towards this theory myself. The prosecutor also put forward this motive was that Samantha did all of this to gain attention and ultimately try and use this situation to become a YouTube star. A million dollar question, what was the motive? Ernie is dead because Samantha in seeking attention, using this rhetoric of Ernie being abusive to her and not treating her right, um, she just finally told somebody who would do something about it. I love you guys. I think she thought this murder was gonna really put the spotlight on her and, you know, make her a YouTube star ultimately. And the reason why I'm leaning towards that, I'm not saying that that is the sole motive. I definitely feel like that entered her head. And it's because I have watched all of her videos. I do kind of get that vibe from her, that she does a lot of things for attention. She also comes across incredibly delusional. She talks in her videos like she has a lot of people watching her and I realize you gotta fake it till you make it, but she's taking that to the extreme. She also sets up a PO box so her fans can send things in. And I wanted to tell everybody, like I do have a PO box if you want to send fan mail. And then one thing that I just, I can't believe, maybe it is true, I don't know, but when I watched this video, my jaw hit the ground because in one video, she talks about making a movie with Gerard Butler. Uh, but really, I've just, I've been working a lot. Um, I've been doing some extra work on some movies uh, and that's been really, really fun. I've been, I did a Gerard Butler movie here recently, and uh, so that's really cool. There's another one that has Rooney, uh, fuck, I can't remember her, Rooney Mara. Yeah, she was the star of the other one I was in here recently, and that's been a blast. Everything's been so much fun working on that. Um, I just, I can't believe it. Maybe she did. Maybe she was like an extra in like a film or something. Like if you guys can confirm that, please let me know. <laughs> and I just feel like the way she was talking, it definitely fits into the narrative of that she wants to be a star. She wants to be famous. And a lot of the times in her videos as well, she would talk about how crazy her life was. How she had these two sets of twins and just her life was crazy. And she had all of these stories that she wanted to share. And you got to think about the time frame that she was uploading as well. She was uploading videos from 2010 to 2014, which is arguably the peak of reality TV. And a lot of these reality TV shows show people essentially doing nothing but just living their crazy scripted lives and becoming famous for it. And I think she truly thought that herself and the life that she led and the family that she had could be like a reality show. I don't know, that's just kind of the vibe that I got from her. And she 100% dramatizes pretty much everything that goes on in her life. Like at one point, she talks about her house burning down, which I couldn't find out if that actually happened or not. 
And in Samantha's case, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't and she was just talking about it for a video. So yeah, those are the theories. There's obviously the abuse theory. There's the Ernie leaving her and trying to get custody of the children. And then there is the theory of her trying to become a YouTube star and become famous. And if it was the latter one, well, Samantha got what she wanted. She uh, finally is famous, but for all of the wrong reasons, obviously. But it's just hard to imagine, isn't it, that people would murder somebody to try and become YouTube famous, to try and get subscribers and to try and get views. And it's crazy sometimes thinking about what people will do to get attention. And unfortunately, in the world that we live in, nothing surprises me anymore. So that's why it really doesn't surprise me if Samantha's goal was to use Ernie's murder to get YouTube famous. And in one of her YouTube videos, she does say, if I was gonna kill someone, it wouldn't be a kid. Um, out of anybody, it would. if I was gonna kill somebody, it would definitely never be a kid. And when you hear those words and you know what she's done, it doesn't look good, does it? But what I can't understand is the motive of the other three men. In all of the research that I did, I did not find a scrap of evidence to even suggest what Jonathan, Jose and Octavius's motives were. I mean, Jonathan and Samantha did know each other kind of well, but they still didn't even know each other for that long. And I think Jose and Octavius literally just met her. It's like, why are these three men willing to murder someone for Samantha for absolutely nothing in return? It's like Jonathan has apparently said that he got really angry at the thought of a man abusing a woman, which is all well and good. Yeah, I can understand that. I feel like any reasonable person would get angry at abuse happening but that still doesn't explain why you would go and murder them. I mean, I don't know, was Samantha expecting to get money from this murder and all of the attention? Was she expecting to do like interviews and all stuff like that? And did she promise to pay them? I just can't wrap my head around why Jonathan, Jose and Octavius would do this and risk getting caught, which obviously they probably would do and they did, and spend the rest of their lives in prison for Samantha who they've apparently only just met. And this is just such a tragic, heartbreaking case. My heart really does go out to Ernie's family. He was completely innocent in all of this. He was a caring, loving father. He provided for his family. And it's a complete tragedy that he has been taken away from his family, but also his children. His children have lost a father. And he was also so young. He was only 29 when he got murdered, which is so incredibly young. He had his whole life ahead of him. And because of Samantha's decision, because ultimately I know that Jose was the one that pulled the trigger and obviously Jonathan and Octavius helped him. But ultimately, Samantha was the one that killed Ernie. It was her decision. She decided to leave that door open. And because of her decision, she took away Ernie from his family, but she also took away the father of her child. And also because of her decisions, she's now left her children without parents. And as far as I'm aware, all five children are with Samantha's mom, their grandmother. And I just hope they're okay. I just hope that they can somehow recover from this. And I just hope they're doing okay. That is the case of Samantha Wolford. So let me know all of your thoughts, theories, opinions down below. Like, do you reckon that she killed him for YouTube fame? Because I'm definitely leaning towards that theory myself, which is just so like, that, that, that should never be a reason, but that is the theory that I am leaning towards myself. As always, please let me know your case suggestions down below because I always want to know what you want to hear next and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.